So it's time for another What Am I Sewing and Growing Guide and this time we're going to cover September. I love sewing in September, it's my favourite month for sewing. There's still so much stuff you can sew, it's going to feed you for such a long period of time. It's such a kind of reliable and predictable month normally for sewing and you still, you know, for a lot of things you don't need grow lights and all of that sort of thing, it's such a great month. And for a year round gardener, it's so exciting. And I'm sitting in this polytunnel now and the stuff that I'm going to be sewing in September, a lot of it will be going into this polytunnel. So all of this has to be cleared uh, towards the end of September and early October. Anyway, what I always like to do though is just have a quick look at what we sewed in August. And so I'll just scroll through my growing guide, which is on my iPad here. And you'll find a link to this growing guide in the description below. Uh, we'll just talk a little bit about how all of those things are going. So let me just pull up this screen so that you can see it as well. Okay, so the Tough Ball Onions, they're doing pretty well. I've got a few successions of those. I've talked about that in the past. Basically, it's very unpredictable with, with overwintered onions, what the right timing is, because you don't know what the weather conditions are gonna be. And as a result, you don't know whether they're gonna to go to seed on you. So I do a few successions. And the Miner's Lattice is also doing great. That's coming on really well. Again, I've got a few successions of that. I've got successions that go outside. I've got successions that I eat early in sort of November time and ones that I really have for midwinter and sort of very early spring. And I've got successions that I've got in the polytunnel as well. And the ones in the polytunnel do far better than the ones outside. So if you can find space undercover in a low tunnel, cold frame polytunnel, it's really worth considering miner's lettuce a little bit later in September uh, to plant out there. <coughs> Lamb's lettuce is doing good. In fact, I've got a tray of that in here in the polytunnel right now that needs a few of them pricking out um, to fill uh, modules that haven't germinated. But also, you know, I, I put two, generally put two seeds of lamb's lettuce in each module and germination was too good. So there's quite a few that just need uh, pulling out, thinning out. Uh, radishes planted out, they're coming on quite nicely. Uh, salad onions are pretty much ready for planting out right now. Um, and the turnips are doing great actually. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy with those. They're coming on very nicely. Uh, the kales I didn't do. So I probably mentioned in the August guide that sometimes I do kales and sometimes I don't. And it's down to how well my brassicas are doing when I do the kind of walk around in August. And this year, they're doing really good. And I don't think I'm gonna need uh, overwintered kales to eat in spring. I think I'm gonna have more than enough to eat in spring. In fact, I haven't even done uh, spring cabbages this year because I think I'm just gonna have plenty of brassicas and I just wanna, don't wanna cut the beds up with veg that I'm not gonna eat. Uh, so I didn't bother. <coughs> But if I'd had some problems like I had last year, then I needed those kales for eating in spring. As I say, this year, very little pest damage, no club root to speak of in the main brassica beds. Uh, everything's looking pretty healthy, a bit of white fly and a few little bits and pieces of problems, but generally speaking, I'm comfortable. Um, spinach that I did in July, has just gone to seed. That sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't. You don't really know, it's all down to weather conditions. Um, and so I've got the next batch of spinach just ready. Uh, so the responder that I sowed, when was it? I don't know, sometime 17th of August. Um, that's ready for planting out now. So I've got one more harvest off that uh, spinach that's gone to seed. Then this new batch will go in and it'll end be a couple of weeks before I'm back with spinach again. So it's no big uh, sort of tragedy. As I said, another succession of tough ball, another succession of miner's lettuce. I do three. Uh, another succession of lamb's lettuce and then a whole load of salads, uh, all of which are just about to be pricked out in fact. So uh, they're doing quite nicely. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, more radish, salad rocket, again, doing quite nicely, and more salad onions. So I think 
that is pretty much it that's worth talking about for August. So let's just pull up September. So I did do a video back in August about a sort of rough idea of what I'm going to be doing in September. And I always refine my ideas. I pour over my records for last year. I look around at how much space I've got. And, you know, I have a good old think about what I can do beyond my rough cut plan. So my rough cut plan has most of the basic things in about, you know, about the right quantities. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still probably spent another two hours uh, thinking about it to get it just about right. And so I'm going to do some more tough ball, partly because I just happen to have a seed packet uh, it's got plenty of seeds left in it. They're quite expensive seeds. This packet is a few years old. Uh, I just want to use them up because uh, they definitely, definitely won't be worth uh, growing next year. And if I find some space to put them in, I'll put them in it. If I don't find any space, I'll just discard them. I don't mind, as I say, because they're just spare seeds. And then I said the miner's lettuce that's going to go in this polytunnel, uh, I'm going to do at the beginning of September. So it'll give it sort of four or five weeks. Uh, to grow on. It takes a little bit longer than lettuce, for example, to sort of grow to planting out time. Um, but as I said, it's such a fantastic crop. You know, I, I know I rave about it. Maybe you'll grow it and you don't like it. But I think save it for winter. Don't bother eating it before winter, but save it for winter. And it is such a great crop. So the earliest true lettuce that I'm going to do to grow all the way through winter now is Brighton. I'm just getting drips falling on me from the polytunnel roof. Um, and it's just such a slow one to get started. And I want it to grow into a nice big head in the middle of winter, because I need some head lettuces to harvest because I can't get through winter with just harvesting individual leaves. I just don't have enough plants. So I need to store up leaves in big heads and harvest those through winter in addition to my harvesting of individual leaves. Brighton is one of the best. It really stands well into the middle of winter with a good head, with not many problems, not much mildew or anything like that. So uh, it's really good from that point of view, but say it's really slow to get going. So I'm just gonna give it an extra week or so. Um, <clears throat> Pak Choi and Tatsoi and Komatsuma, all my favorite Asian greens, another batch of those. I normally should have actually should have done those back in late August, but for whatever reason, I just didn't get around to it. So I'll do those in early September and it won't matter very much. Um, and my last batch of salad onions. Sometimes I wonder whether it's worth doing this last batch. But again, it's a bit like the tough ball. If I find I've got a space, salad onions are always a great thing to put in that space because, you know, salad onions, I think, are the most valuable crop that I grow full stop. When you work out how much a bunch of salad onions cost you in the shop, organic ones particularly, uh, and then you work out how many you can grow in a bed, it, you know, you, you can probably get 40 pounds worth at, in, off a square meter or something like that. It's quite incredible. Um, so, and we eat a lot, a lot of salad onions and everybody always loves them. So, you know, they say that, and I agree with that, I can't eat shop bought salad onions anymore. In fact, I've not eaten them for literally I think seven years <laughs> so that's quite a long time given how much I like them um, and that's because we grow them all year round not because I'm depriving myself um, and then I start with my winter spinach so my favoured winter spinach is giant winter or winter giant depending on where you get it from but it's the same thing um, and it I think truly is from my perspective I've been growing I don't know 20 different types of spinach I think it's the best spinach for actually harvesting in winter. It's not the best in autumn and it goes to seed quite quickly in spring. But if you want a spinach to harvest in winter, it's probably, you know, in my experience, it's the best one. You know, it keeps on growing all the way through winter. It doesn't have many uh, mildew problems. It doesn't need to be overly pampered. I can pop it in a cold frame, even fairly well ventilated in a cold frame. And it does just fine. In fact, it doesn't actually do better 
in the polytunnel than it does in the coal frame. It's really good, but in a coal frame, it does way better than it does under fleece or unprotected outside. So anyway, Giant Winter is my recommendation for a true winter spinach. And I like Red Kitten for spring, although I'm trying Rubino this year. Um, so next up is Orkney cauliflower. Now, you know, I don't claim to have tried all the different cauliflower varieties, but I've tried, I don't know, 10 or something like that. And this is my favoured one for a harvest in that sort of May time scale, you know, sort of maybe sometimes in some years it's the beginning of May, some years it's the end of May. This year actually I was still harvesting some right at the beginning of June. So because of that unpredictability, I tend to grow it in the beds that I'm planning to put melons in, because I don't need the melons to go in until late May, probably better actually early June. And so it's a perfect kind of timing for me uh, to have the cauliflowers in those beds. And I just do a couple of successions because obviously you don't want all your cauliflowers to come at once because we don't like frozen cauliflower. Uh, so about 10th September is a good first succession and then a couple of weeks later. And then a whole load of lettuces, loads and loads of lettuces. You need a lot of lettuce <laughs> if you eat. I mean, how many, how many salads do we grow? I think at the moment I'm running about 14, maybe 16, 16 boxes of salad. So then they're two litre boxes. So 32 litres of salad a week. And if you want to harvest that consistently all the way through the year, you need, as I said, to grow some that you're going to harvest as individual leaves and that you'll be harvesting those in sort of late October, November, early December. And then they will, lettuce leaves stop growing about the middle of December, pretty much. I mean, they hardly grow at all, but they will grow, grow a little tiny bit. So you need from the middle of December until certainly early February, most of the lettuce you're gonna eat has to have grown and be stored in the lettuce head by the middle of December. And so some of my lettuces are for that purpose and some of them are for individual leaves. And then by the middle of February, growth really kicks off again. And by that time I should have eaten all my head lettuces and then I can start picking individual leaves again. So there's a few games that you play if you eat the sort of volumes of salad that my family eats. And we don't just eat lettuce, of course, you know, because as I said, you, we, in our salad mixes, we'll also have spinach, uh, we'll have Asian greens, we'll have miner's lettuce, Claytonia, we'll have lamb's lettuce or corn salad. Uh, as well as salad onions and all, you know all sorts of other stuff. So, you know, it's a pretty rich salad mix in winter, but lettuce is still a great ingredient into that. So, I won't go through every one, but what I will say is that um, read my notes. Basically, is what it comes down to. There's notes on every one of these, and some of them are trials. I've been very lucky that um, somebody's. Uh, I think sent me a whole load of lettuce that they grow over winter in Poland. It gets a bit colder in Poland than it is here. So that isn't the guarantee it'll be a great lettuce over here, to be fair, because when things are really cold, one of the things is you don't get as many mildew problems. So in our mild climate here, we can actually often get mildew problems on lettuce because of our relatively mild climate. So a, a lettuce that does really well in the cold is not necessarily a great one for us. So for example, winter density, which is one that a lot of people rave about. I often get stem rot on winter density uh, when other people don't. So um, anyway, I'm not going to say, go through every lettuce, but there's a lot of lettuces here and I'm trialing a lot of lettuce. I'm always trialing new lettuces, but my kind of favored for winter are Rickia, Roxy, and Grenoble Red, or Red Grenoble. So you can see there's a lot of others that I'm trialing in addition to that. And for the head lettuces, my favoured one is um, Brighton. So I have to 
constrain myself not to get too carried away with trials otherwise you know if those trials go wrong I might go hungry but again if I don't try new things I don't discover new things so it's worth a go um, and then also for the polytunnel I'm going to do some Tatsui, Komatsuma and um, red Pachoi or red stem Pachoi and we probably will do a little bit of Joy Choi but I probably won't put it in the polytunnel uh, it gets too big uh, I'll probably put it in one of the low tunnels if I've got a bit of space. And you could do Salad Rocket now, again, to grow undercover. I did that last year. In fact, I've done it many years. I don't, just don't think it earns its keep now. I, I just the, the leaf quality isn't um, high enough for me. Uh, so although I'll do an earlier batch, which I've already got growing now, um, I won't do a, a late batch for, for truly harvesting over winter, um, but I will do Wild Rocket. Um, and Wild Rocket, I think, is really great. So you're not going to be eating Wild Rocket through winter. You're going to be starting it in the middle of September, overwintering it in a polytunnel or a greenhouse or something like that in a reasonably sized pot, and then planting it out. I planted mine out last year in March, I think and grows into a really big clump so you don't need very many of them uh, it's fantastic i mean it's so crisp and crunchy and so tasty uh, it's actually i think much better than salad rocket so uh, anyway that's the wild rocket and then another succession of giant winter and i have multiple succession because my giant winter is generally following something that i'm harvesting so it might be a pepper bed or something like that and I don't want to take all my pepper beds out at the same time and I don't want to plant all of my spinach at the same time because if I take all my if I plant all my spinach at the same time I'm going to have a huge glut in late autumn so I want to stagger my successions and I also as I say don't want to take all my peppers out because I'll take out the beds that are the least productive and leave any beds that have still got a lot of peppers to ripen and that means obviously we get a lot more peppers and we don't get a glut of spinach. Um, <coughs> you could now put your elephant garlic in uh, in September. I don't uh, because I just plant mine um, because it's in a perennial elephant garlic bed. I just leave some in the ground or plant some uh, rounds that uh, I've harvested and just let them come up at their own pace. Um, I mentioned that I'm not doing any spring cabbages and that's not 100% true because I am doing red drum head which is not you know traditionally a spring cabbage um, but I was so so happy with it last year so I did a big trial where I did lots of different successions of red drum head grew them in lots of different environments and what I found was that the ones that I did about uh, 20th of September or thereabouts um, towards the end of September they did the best not a single one of them went to seed they all grew to maturity and some grew bigger than others so the earlier successions grew bigger than the later successions obviously um, but um, yeah so I, given that nothing went to seed I don't think there's much of a risk of starting them a little bit earlier um, but they do take a while so you won't be eating them in April or early May, but you'll probably be eating them in late May, early June. So they are quite a commitment, but we so love red cabbage and it's so healthy that we're prepared to sort of make that long bed commitment, long duration commitment. That said, we don't actually plant them out until sort of February time. So we will have had maybe two harvests off the bed that they're going to go in um, through autumn and uh, sort of uh, and winter. And then, as I say, we'll sort of start planting them out. We often interplant them as well. Uh, so we take out, for example, if it's a spinach bed or something like that, we'll take out four spinach and pop the red cabbage in the gaps uh, and then progressively sort of harvest the spinach as the red cabbage grows and then eventually the red cabbage will take over the whole bed you know that type of thing um, and cauliflower actually we do the same with the cauliflowers again interplanting it into say a spinach or a lettuce bed or something um, so that's this is my last succession of the orkney cauliflowers 
and I haven't just I've got a few uh, graffiti uh, seeds left over so I'm going to try overwintering graffiti it's a great early cauliflower it looks amazing and uh, I've just got to pause now because I've got a helicopter going over the joys of living next to an airport so um, yeah so I'm going to try it there's a chance that it won't thrive uh, there's a chance that it might die off, who knows. Um, it's worth a try, isn't it? You know, because it's so beautiful um, and so healthy that uh, I just can't resist giving it a go. And then I'll do another batch of these Brighton lettuces again to grow for whole heads in winter. Um, but these will be for later on, you know, in sort of, you know, the end of January or something like that. Uh, whereas the others were for uh, sort of you know, the middle of December. And then then these are most of, from now on, I think, most of the lettuces that I'm going to be growing for individual leaves. Uh, so they don't make it take as long to mature. So I start them later. And that is uh, Grenoble Red and uh, all that. So I'm also doing, again, this is a bit of an experiment. Um, a whole load of things in the beet family uh, which I'm going to grow at, at quite a high density uh, for small salad leaves. So I already described what we sort of have in our salads normally uh, in winter but I thought well let's give it a go uh, with smaller beet leaves you know and uh, crop those quite intensively so they keep on growing and so I've chosen this uh, Albina Verduna beetroot uh, because it's reported to have really good leaves. Now that's probably in spring, but who knows, let's give it a go. Uh, bull's blood, which is always considered to be a better leaf than it is a beetroot. Uh, and it does, I've grown that before over winter and it does pretty well. Absolutely, adds so much lovely color to the salad mixes. And I'm afraid to say, I like my salad look mixes to be colourful. I don't like them to just be green leaves. Uh, and then rhubarb chard and then forward hook giant chard. And that generally the forward hook one is considered to be the best uh, for overwintering for small leaves, even though it does grow giant leaves if it's left. So that is it. That is what I'm planning uh, to sow in September. And I will do a preview video for what I'm planning to sow in um, uh, October in a couple of days time and I should point out that there's a lot of complexity in all of that if you sort of dive into all of the details and I do try and guide you through step by step all of that complexity in two places one you can just go to my ebook and you can read about um, growing year round, you can read about growing under cover, you can read about uh, all oh, a plane coming over. And you can read about all the different successional sowings for each of the vegetable types that you're interested in in the individual growing guide section of my ebook. So there's lots to go out there. But sometimes even that is just too overwhelming. It's sometimes too overwhelming for me. Um, so I do write a weekly newsletter called Outgrow. And that says, you know, this is what I'm gonna sow this week. Uh, this is what I've planted this week. And this is what's germinated and whatever. Uh, and it's got all the kind of nitty gritty details to help you sort of navigate the complexity of growing year round, including lots of guidance about you know, how to grow under cover, how to ventilate, how to water, you know, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, so, yeah, I do recommend you subscribe to that and you can find a link to that in the description below, but you can also just go to it at steverichards.substack.com. My name's Steve, this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Alarmic Channel, and I'll see you soon.